basically, I'm going to be doing singing baseball songs. Most of them I've written, but there will be a few songs that you know. Uh, we'll be doing trivia, baseball trivia. I'll be telling some stories and doing some other stuff that I can't explain in a few words. But uh, try to have some fun with it. Uh, try to be as interactive as possible. So if you have a question or a comment or whatever, you know, feel free to speak right up. Preferably uh, between the songs, but uh, you know, it works works best that way. And before we get going, I want to see what kind of demographic I'm dealing with here. So, how many of you are like diehard baseball fans? Okay, good. And how many of you are just kind of casual fans? And how many of you are only here for the food? <laughs> All right, at least you're honest. I appreciate that. Okay, well, anyway, to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I was a sports writer for 18 years, and I uh, wrote for the Patriot Ledger, the Boston Globe, uh, the Lowell Sun, Associated Press, Baseball Digest, a lot of newspapers, magazines, and whatever. And uh, I did radio for the Lowell Spinners. I don't remember, they're, they're no longer in existence, but I, I did uh, color commentary for the Lowell Spinners for three years. And I covered the uh, World Series in 1985 and 1986. Now, in 1985, I did not have a laptop. That's because nobody had laptops, you know? They weren't invented yet. They were portable computers, to be sure, but uh, nothing that you'd want on your lap. Trust me on that. So in order to file my stories in 1985, I had to actually drive to the Associated Press office in the city where the game was and, uh, and then file my story using their computer to send it to my, my newspaper. And uh, that year was St. Louis in Kansas City. So, Trust me, it was a lot of fun driving around in some strange city in a rented car in the middle of the night trying to find these offices. But apparently, I found them all. All the stories got filed, so that was, that was good. So that was 1985. 1986, though, I got one of these. This was the Radio Shack TRS-80. It was a landmark technological advancement. You could actually type your story on this computer, hook it up to a phone line, because there was no internet back then. So you hook it up to a phone line and send your story to the newspaper. So that was great. Uh, saved a lot of aggravation. You just type your story in the press box and go home or go to the hotel or whatever. It was kind of crude by today's standards. Uh, you know, you can see it's got a very small screen. Uh, five lines is all you could get on there. And it had 21,000 bytes of memory. So to compare that uh, to an average smartphone today, that's 0.00008% of the memory of a uh, smartphone. But it was, it was pretty, pretty great back then, I'll tell you. So you were working from home way back when? Yes. And uh, I've been a big, big fan my, almost my entire life. I've been to 94 major and minor league ballparks, which is even more impressive when you consider my wife would, would rather have a root canal than go to a baseball game. And <laughs> I, I, I'm not kidding you there. And uh, this is one, a t-shirt from one of the places I went, Nashville, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and saw a game there. First time I ever saw the pitch clock. First time and only time I've ever seen the pitch clock, and it works, works pretty well, trust me. And uh, I've got a couple of baseball CDs. Uh, they're in the Hall of Fame archi archive in uh, Cooperstown, New York, which is across from the main museum. And uh, that's where they have uh, printed material and recordings and, and things like that. So we're going to do a free drawing for uh, one of the baseball CDs later on. But it's, it's just kind of a scheme to get you to stay for the whole show, really. But uh, that's okay. Anyway, I'm going to start off with a song about a ball player that I'm sure you've never heard of. His name is uh, Mike Hessman. I have my harmonica holder. I can't, can't, can't play the harmonica and the guitar without this thing. It's, it's uh, physically impossible. So the guy's name is Mike Hessman. He holds kind of a unique record. He holds a record for the most home runs hit in the minor leagues, which is kind of a dubious record. You know, I mean, he has spent 19 years in the minors, 20 years overall. He played overseas for a year. and. Uh, you know, it was a great achievement. He hit 433 home runs, but uh, that's probably not the way he envisioned his professional career panning out. He was, uh, he was on 16 different teams over those 20 years, and there were three seasons in which he, he uh, played for four different teams because he, he, he had power. He had a commodity that the, the teams wanted, so he would sign a contract, get released, and sign another one, and et cetera, et cetera. 
And uh, so I wrote a song about him because I thought it was kind of an interesting story. And uh, I sent it to him, and I, I, I was kind of curious as to what he thought of it. So I actually met him a few years ago. Uh, he retired after the 2015 season and became a hitting coach in the minor leagues. And in 2018, he was working for the Erie Sea Wolves of the uh, Eastern League. So they had a doubleheader one day up in uh, Portland, Maine. I drove up there and met him. And he was very gracious, has no regrets whatsoever, no hard feelings about his uh, baseball career. And uh, so we, we chatted for a while. And I, we took a photo together, which is on the uh, table over there. And uh, this is his story. My Kessman, that name might not ring a bell, but he's a legend in his own right with a grand story to tell. He hit more home runs than any minor leaguer ever did. It took dedication, heart and soul, and a ton of grit. He just kept playing cause he loved it. Living out his dream, playing baseball for a living ever since he was 18. Years flew by just like the wind He never lost that thirst Becoming minor league home run king Was a blessing and a curse It started out in Macon Young Mike just had no fear In 1997 he hit 21 that year Danville, Greenville and Myrtle Beach along the way the homers kept a coming on the road to AAA. He just kept playing cause he loved it. Living out his dream, playing baseball for a living ever since he was 18. The years flew by just like the wind. He never lost that thirst. Becoming minor league home run king was a blessing and a curse. That Mike turned 30, he was still in triple A. And then 31 and 32, the time just slipped away. He played in Mexico and Japan, Venezuela too. 16 teams in 20 years, till finally he was through. Mike ever make the majors? The answer is yes. He had cups of coffee with the Braves, the Tigers, and the Mets. Fourteen big league homers, five seasons in the show. With little luck, he might have stuck. I guess we'll never know. He just kept playing cause he loved it. Living out his dream. Playing baseball for a living ever since he was 18. The years flew by just like the wind. He never lost that thirst. Becoming minor league home run king was a blessing and a curse. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Excuse me? Did you write I wrote that, yes. Actually, the first bunch of songs I'm, I'm going to be doing t today will, will be uh, original songs. I feel it's important to do original music, you know, because first of all, nobody else plays my songs as far as I know. So if I don't do it, it's not, it's not happening. But the other thing is more a philosophical kind of uh, concept is that if nobody ever did original music, then there would be no music. So anyway, going to do our first trivia question. I like this trivia question a lot because uh, it, it harkens back to a different era when baseball was a lot different. So, can you name the pitcher who holds the record for the most strikeouts in one game? Anybody? Pedro, I think his high was 17, I believe, and that's not the record, but that was a good guess because he was a strikeout pitcher. Roger Clemens is an even better guess, and I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, so, anybody else? 
Nobody's going to get this, though. Okay, so if you mentioned Roger Clemens, Randy Johnson, Kerry Wood, or Max Scherzer, each of them struck out 20 batters in a nine-inning game. And that's the record for a nine-inning game. But back, you go back a few decades, and the starting pitcher just used to pitch the whole game. So, in, in, and actually, Clemens did it twice. He's the only pitcher ever to strike out 20. But in 1962, Tom Chaney of the Washington Senators struck out 21 batters in a 16-inning complete game victory over the Baltimore Orioles. And he threw 228 pitches in that game. So, there you go. <laughs> back in the old days when the pitchers were... They didn't just count the pitches and pull them out, you know, in the fourth inning or something. Anyway, this is a song about a ball player I think you know. His name is Johnny Damon. He was a member of the 2004 curse-busting world championship winning Red Sox. He could do a lot of things for you. He could run. He could hit. He could hit for power. He could field. He couldn't throw worth a damn, but, you know, he can't have everything. And uh, he was very instrumental in the Red Sox world championship that year. I mean, he had, he had a grand slam against the Yankees in the seventh game of the league championship series. He had four extra base hits in the World Series. And uh, he, was very, he was a very big cog in that machine. And the following year, he batted 316. That was his all-time career high. And over the winter, he became a free agent, and he did the unthinkable, which was to sign a contract with the New York Yankees for a mere... $12 million more. I mean, the, the nerve of that guy. So I wrote a song about it, and people thought it was pretty amusing back then. And then, you know, after a few years, it got, got a little dated, so I, I stopped playing it. But now, now, it, now it's retro. It's nostalgic, so it's making a comeback. Why did you go, Johnny Damon? Why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City You'll be having this much fun. They cut your hair and shave your beard. You smile and just said thanks. We don't love you anymore because now you're with the Yanks. Perhaps they didn't tell you. Perhaps you did not know. Left center fields 450 plus. Are you going to make that throw? There's lots more ground to cover. You're getting slower every year. And I bet by mid-July you wish that you were here. Why did you go, Johnny Damon? Why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City you'll be having this much fun? They cut your hair and shave your beard. You smile and just said thanks. We don't love you anymore because now you're with the Yanks. Georgie don't like losing So you best be on your guard If you don't hit 300 Life will never be so hard And if you don't make the playoffs And win a couple rounds The fans will cuss and swear at you And run you out of town Why did you go, Johnny Damon? Why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City You'll be having this much fun? They cut your hair and shave your beard. You smile, just said thanks. We don't love you anymore, but now you're with the Yanks. Johnny Damon, why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City you'll be having this much fun? You're out of sight and out of mind, don't think you'll be missed. We don't need you anymore, we got Coco Crisps. Alrighty, thank you. So Coco Crisp, he was the guy that replaced Johnny Damon in center field. He's kind of an average journeyman type of player. But they had a, the Red Sox had a long-range plan. They had this hot shot in the minor leagues named Jacoby Ellsbury. And he became the uh, center fielder before too long. 
So I actually rewrote the final chorus to reflect that bit of information. And then Ellsbury signed with the Yankees too. I said, the heck with it. You know. All right. All right, I'm going to put the guitar down for a bit. I'm going to tell you a little story about a project that I did. back in 1985, and this was a nationwide, far-reaching campaign to get rid of the designated hitter rule, and I realized it's that heresy, talking like that in Boston, because, uh, you know, David Ortiz, you know, he helped them win three World Series, he hit more than 500 home runs, he's in the Hall of Fame, you know, but uh, I never really liked it. It takes, for me, it takes too much strategy out of the game. Uh, when you have a the pitcher bats, you know, and you want to make a pitching change in the late innings. Well, you got to say, well, where is he in the lineup? Who have I got to come in out of the bullpen? Who's going to pinch hit, et cetera, et cetera. On the other side of that is that if you have a player who is a really good hitter but not a great defensive player, well, without the DH, you have to find a place for this guy to play, and that can be uh, part of the strategy as well. So, but anyway, so I decided to... Uh, to, to get rid of the, uh, do a campaign to get rid of the designated hitter. Now, I want to see what, what you people think about this. So, uh, I'm going to take an informal poll here. How many of you like the designated hitter rule? How many of you don't like the designated hitter rule? Wow. What is it? Well, that, I was getting to that. <laughs> and I was, and how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Okay, so I will explain. So, in the late 60s and early 70s, the uh, offense in baseball was dwindling. It was spiraling downward at an alarming rate. There were less hits or less home runs or less runs, and the owners were getting fearful that fans would lose interest. So uh, the American League decided to experiment with this new rule whereby the pitcher didn't have to hit. Pitcher, typically, but not all the time, is, is not, not, that, not a great hitter. So the pitcher wouldn't hit. There would be a designated hitter or a DH uh, that would hit in place of the pitcher. So the DH would hit but not play the field. The pitcher would pitch but not hit. So essentially you had two players sharing one position which goes against every principle of baseball. But people liked it and it did provide a little, little bit of offense. And then the American League decided to adopt it full time. So uh, I was getting afraid that the National League would adopt it, and which, which it did this year anyway. So I decided to launch this national campaign to get rid of the rule and have everybody just forget about it. So if you're going to do a national campaign, you have to have a catchy slogan. So my slogan was, uh, dump the DH. And, and I, I, I printed up a couple thousand bumper stickers. I, I made press releases. I uh, had a brochure. And I just sent it out to anybody and everybody I could think of, radio, TV, newspapers, magazines, what, whatever. And it was the 1985 version of going viral. It was just, it went nuts. Written up in the New York Times, uh, dozens of big daily newspapers all over the country in W, they ran a special on it on, uh, not a special, but a, like a five minute segment on uh, TBS. Um, I did 30 radio talk shows, coast to coast. I was on in San Francisco one night for like three hours, it was, it was crazy. and. Uh, Ran a, ran a nice piece in Sports Illustrated. They even came into my house and took a photo. I have a copy of it over there. That's like my 15 minutes of fame. Now, when it ran in Sports Illustrated, the, the, the campaign just ratcheted up a couple of notches because at that point, Sports Illustrated had a global distribution of more than 4 million subscribers. And I was selling the bumper sticker and the brochure for a couple of dollars to finance the campaign. I basically broke even. So anyway, when it... Uh, when it ran in Sports Illustrated, I started getting mail from all over the world. It was pretty amazing. I was, people were mailing me cash from New Zealand and Australia, and I got a money order from Saudi Arabia and Europe and Canada and Mexico. It was, it was absolutely, uh, absolutely crazy. And uh, eventually, the bumper sticker itself got into the Hall of Fame. Uh, I have a, a copy of the photo over there. It's in a nice glass case, and my name is... Underneath it, I'm very proud of that. And uh, so basically, the campaign didn't really accomplish its goals. Uh, and the National League actually adopted the DH this year, which horrified me. But I uh, had a lot of fun doing it. And I uh, and, uh, got into the Hall of Fame. should also mention that part of the, my aversion to the, uh, 
So the DH is that we, we don't get to see the pitchers hit. And a lot of the pitchers are like really good hitters. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Rick Wise used to pitch for the Red Sox. Uh, he pitched for a couple other teams as well. In 1971, Rick Wise had probably the greatest individual game in the history of baseball. He was pitching for the Phillies. He threw a no-hitter and hit two home runs in the same game. That's, that's pretty amazing. Earl Wilson pitched for the Red Sox, 35 career home runs, including two as a pinch hitter. And because uh, he was a big, strong guy, you know, and he could, he could put it out when he got a hold of it. And Jim Tobin pitched for the Boston Braves, only pitcher ever to hit three home runs in one game. And perhaps you may have heard of the greatest hitting pitcher of all time. His name was Babe Ruth. Uh, one year he hit, he won 13 games as a pitcher and also led the league in home runs. And he was such a good hitter that they decided, to, the Yankees decided to change him into a, a full-time outfielder. So imagine if they had the DH rule back when Babe Ruth was playing. He never would have become a hitter because uh, he was a great pitcher. He was a terrific pitcher. He never would have become a hitter. Uh, Baseball wouldn't have been saved. The entire evolution of the universe would have changed, and I probably wouldn't be standing here today. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, I intentionally omitted one of the great hitting feats by a pitcher because it's the uh, subject of this song, and it's all about uh, a guy named Tony Cloninger. Now, anybody know what Tony Cloninger did? That was noteworthy. Yes, sir. That's right. Absolutely right. He's the only pitcher ever to hit two grand slams in one game. I figure that's worthy of a song. Uh, and probably it'll never happen again because they don't hit anymore, so. Now, a couple of things you should know about this song to enhance your enjoyment, or at least enable you to understand what's going on. So when you have a, a nine-man lineup with the pitcher in it, the eighth place hitter has kind of a tough job because he hits right in front of the pitcher. A lot of times they're gonna walk him and, uh, or intentionally or not intentionally, and uh, pitch to the pitcher instead. So uh, Tony Cloninger pitched for the Atlanta Braves, and, and on that particular game, uh, the eighth place hitter was a guy named Doug, was a guy named Dennis Menke, and uh, he was a pretty good ball player. So in the first inning, uh, there were two two runners aboard and two outs, and Menke came up, and they decided to walk him to pitch to Tony Cloninger, and Cloninger hit a grand slam. Well, three innings later, the exact same scenario presented itself, and they did the exact same thing, and Cloninger hit another grand slam. So uh, that's an integral part of the song, and he ha had nine RBIs in the game, which remains to this day the... Uh, Braves team record, Hank Aaron never had nine RBIs, Eddie Matthews, Joe Adcock, none of those guys. The other thing you should know is that absolutely nothing rhymes with Tony, with Tony Cloninger. So his nickname was Tony C. And uh, I realize, you know, around here, when you think of Tony C, you think of Tony Canigliaro, who was a great Red Sox star at a very young age. So I call this song, The Other Tony C. July the 3rd and 6 to 6 Baseball history in the mix That day the Giants played Tony Cloninger and the Braves Tony C was on the hill You don't remember him Well now you will It was his claim to fame At two grand slams in that game The Braves scored three to start the day Two men on Two way, it was only the first inning, but the fun was just beginning. Dennis Menke walked to the plate. Skipper Herman Frank said, wait, the strategy is clear. Let's walk Menke and pitch to Tony C. He took a mighty cut, hit long fly ball. The baseball soared right over the wall. Tony C would touch him all on that historic day. Four runs in, just one swing, pretty good, a beautiful thing. Once around was really nice in that game. He did it twice. On to 
inning number four up by nine the Braves got more Tory reached so did bowling two men out but they were rolling Menke walked up to the plate Herman Frank said wait lightning can't strike twice let's walk Menke and pitch to Tony C he took a mighty cut, hit long fly ball, the baseball soared right over the wall. Tony C would touch him all on that historic day. Four runs in, just one swing, pretty good, a beautiful thing. Once around was really nice. In that game, he did it twice. Tony C was not quite done. His single plated one more run on the day. Nine RBIs, a mark no pitcher would reprise. Pitching wise, he did just fine. Struck out five, went all nine on both sides of the ball. Tony C, he did it all. He took a mighty cut, hit long fly ball, the baseball soared right over the wall. Tony C, touch him all on that historic day. Four runs in, just one swing, pretty good, a beautiful thing. Once around was really nice, in that game, he did it twice. Well, one grand slam was really nice on that day. Did it twice. Thank you very much. The Red Sox in 2004 uh, pulled off a big blockbuster trade. They traded Nomar Garcia Power to the Chicago Cubs. And the question is what two players did they receive in return? Yes, sir. See, this guy knows everything. He's on top. Yes. So, what was that? I didn't, I didn't hear. I'm sorry. Okay. They received, uh, it was actually, uh, it's, you know, I don't think you pronounced his name properly. Yes, sir. Jason Veritek was not one of them, but Jason Veritek was part of the, uh, one of the great, trade heists of all time. Uh, he, the, the, the Red Sox traded Heathcliff Slocum, a very mediocre reliever pitcher, to the Seattle Mariners, and they got Jason Baratek and Derek Loback. And that was one of the great trades of all time, because both of those players were, were terrific. And actually, Derek Lowe was instrumental in the uh, 2004 championship team, as was Veritek. But OK, so the. Uh, Okay, so they traded Nomar. It was a very complicated trade. I won't give you all the details. It, it involved four teams, the Red Sox, the Montreal Expos, the Minnesota Twins, and the Chicago Cubs. And the Red Sox, uh, they traded Nomar to the Cubs. They received in return Orlando Cabrera from the uh, Montreal Expos and Doug Minkiewicz from the Minnesota Twins. And uh, uh, I wrote a song about Doug. He recorded the final out of the 2004 World Series, you may recall. But that's, that's not why I wrote the song. I wrote the song because until he came to Boston, I could never pronounce his name. You know, I mean, it's, it's a difficult name to pronounce. Really. And then when they put it in the box score, they take all the vowels out. So that doesn't help you at all. But, but once he got here, you know, it's on radio, it's on TV, it's in the newspaper. I learned how to say it pretty quickly. And I, I, I found that it was a very lyrical type name. It had sort of a nice poetic cadence to it. And uh, it was kind of fun to say. And I figured, well, if it's that much fun to say, it must be like three, four, five times as much fun to sing. So that's why I wrote the song. Doug Minkiewicz. My favorite player, Doug Minkiewicz, he's the man, he's the man. 
Doug Mankiewicz, I just love to say it. Doug Mankiewicz, he's the man, he's the man. When he was a twin, it didn't mean a thing. Then he joined the Sox, and Doug Mankiewicz really rocked. Doug Mankiewicz, he's my favorite player. Doug Mankiewicz, he's the man, he's the man. He's kind to his mother and a former gold lover, Doug. May not make the Hall of Fame, but he's got 12 letters in his name. Doug Mankiewicz, I can't even spell it. Doug Mankiewicz, but I sure do like to yell it. Doug Mankiewicz, he's my favorite player. Doug Mankiewicz, he's the man, he's the man. M-I-E-N-T-K-I-E-W-I-C-Z -I, I think that's right. Doug Mankiewicz, he's my favorite player. Doug Mankiewicz, he just took that ball and ran. Doug Mankiewicz, I just love to say it. Doug Mankiewicz, he's the man, he's the man, he's the man, he's the man. Doug Mankiewicz, he's the man. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. That's my ode to Doug Mankiewicz. And it, it's interesting that his name is mentioned in the song 17 times, and that was his number also. So wasn't intentionally done that way. It was just karma, you know. So I told you about the uh, Dump the DH campaign of 1985, and uh, I decided the following year I was going to do another campaign because I figured now I'm like a big shot, you know, so uh, I, I know how to do this stuff. They knew who I am. So I decided to take on artificial turf because I figure everybody hates artificial turf. It's ugly. The ball takes weird bounces. It's hard on the players physical, physically, and uh, so... I said, I'm going to do another national campaign. So you got to have a catchy f slogan to do a campaign, right? So this is my slogan here, pull out the rug. And uh, at the bottom it says, funded by the Alliance for Natural Playing Fields. I just made that up, you know. <laughs> so anyway, so I, I, uh, I did the same thing. I, I, I mailed out the bumper stickers and I had a brochure and all this other stuff. And for some reason it just didn't, uh, didn't quite catch on the way uh, the dump the DH. I mean, it, it got a nice write-up in USA Today and Sporting News. New York Daily News ran a piece on it. The Boston Papers did a little bit. But I guess the passion just wasn't there. Or maybe it was just going to the well once too often. So, so I've got a couple of hundred bumper stickers left over. If you want one, just <laughs> let me know. I'll be happy to take care of and I actually, about seven or eight years prior to this campaign, I'd written a song about artificial turf. And, uh, you know, it was the 70s, you know, and all these songwriters are writing protest songs. So, baseball fan, protest song, here it is. So, I uh, wrote the song. So, the, I incorporated the song into the campaign. And uh, the song didn't do a whole lot for the campaign. The campaign didn't do a whole lot for the song. But uh, it's on one of my CDs, and I like it. So, here it is. Now we got artificial flavors and artificial snow. The imitation mayonnaise, false teeth, and you know you got artificial colors in your food and for your hair. But that artificial grass is just too much for me to bear. If Abner Doubleday was alive, he'd be gassed. He went to a baseball game and didn't see no grass, just a big green carpet with some fancy white line. A little bit of dirt and those metric signs you see AstroTurf, AstroTurf What have they done to old Mother Earth? I don't want nothing beneath my feet that a horse can't eat So take it away
it all began in Houston where they play the game indoors. They built the big dome stadium, but one of its flaws was the grass just wouldn't grow where the sun refused to shine. So they ripped it out and put in the artificial kind. They put in AstroTurf, AstroTurf. What have they done to old Mother Earth? I don't want nothing neath my feet that a horse can't eat. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I was thinking to myself the other day, this campaign may have had a latent effect on the lords of baseball because there are only four teams now that have artificial turf out of 30, whereas in the 80s, they had many. So maybe I'm just not giving myself enough credit. I don't know. Anyway, this next song is about the 1978 Red Sox. Anybody remember what happened to the Red Sox in 1978? Excuse me? No, actually, yeah, well, what happened, yeah, I think a lot of you have probably selectively blocked it out of your memory because it was a very painful season. They had a 14 and a half game lead on the Yankees, the Red Sox did, uh, in July, and they frittered it all the way. They wound up tied at the end of the regular season. They had to uh, do a one game tiebreaker at Fenway Park to determine the Eastern Division leader. and. Uh, the Red Sox were ahead early in the game. They were ahead 2-0. Yaz had hit a home run. Mike Torres was throwing a shutout. They were looking good. And then in the top of the seventh, Yankees got a couple of guys on, and Bucky Dent came to the plate. And uh, he had, it was in the midst of this terrible slump. And uh, he came up, and uh, he had only hit four home runs the whole season to that point. And, uh, but he hit one over the wall uh, for a three-run homer, put the Yankees ahead to stay. And they went on to win the game. They won the... Eastern Division, they won the American League pennant, they won the World Series, and the Red Sox went home because in 1978 they didn't have any wild card team. So that was kind of unfortunate. The song was also inspired by my mother. She was a big Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And the uh, Dodgers had some great teams in the 40s and 50s, and they could never beat the Yankees in the World Series. Well, they did one time, 1955, but that was the only time. So every other time they lost. And, the battle cry out of Brooklyn every year was wait till next year, and that's the title of this song. This was the best damn team that I ever did see. It had strength up the middle. It had power and speed. Most of the season they could do no wrong. When October rolled around, it was the same old song. Wait until next year. Wait until next year. Exactly what went wrong is all too clear. So near and so far. Close but no cigar. It's a long, long way till opening day and the winter's getting near. Have another beer, wait till next year. We all thought it was a piece of cake, that 12 game lead at the all star break. But the pitching was lousy and the hitting got worse. And the next thing I knew, we were out of first. Wait until next year. Wait until next year. It's a long, long way till opening day and the winter's getting near. Have another beer. Wait till next year. Outs of the summer became the outs of the fall. That baseball team made fools of us all. Squandered that lead. It didn't take long, and October arrived with the same old song. Wait until next year. Wait till next year. 
exactly what went wrong is all too clear. So near and so far, close but no cigar. It's a long, long way till opening day and the winter's getting near. Have another beer, wait till next year. Have another beer, wait till next year. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that didn't bring back too many painful memories for you. One of the things I really love about baseball is that it definitely has the best jargon of all the sports. The best nicknames, the best expressions. Very colorful. So this next song is called Mendoza Line. Anybody know what the Mendoza Line is? Right, 200 batting average. 200 batting average. It was inspired by Mario Mendoza. He was the prototypical slick fielding, weak hitting shortstop. He managed to stay in the major leagues for nine seasons based solely on his defensive ability. And he became infamous one day when uh, George Brett, refer to George Brett, Hall of Fame third baseman. Well, he was talking to reporters one day. He had started the season in an awful slump. And he said something to the effect of, I knew I was off to a slow start when I looked at the averages and saw that I was below the Mendoza line. So from that point forward, Mario Mendoza became this sort of tragic icon, always associated with the 200 batting average. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to write a song about it, and I did. And when I finished it, I liked it enough to go out and record it. Now, when you go into a recording studio, you got to figure, well, what kind of song is this? You know, you got to figure out ahead of time what kind of song is this going to be, what musical genre. You can't really experiment because it's, it's too expensive. So to my ear, Mendoza line sounds like something from the wild, wild west. So we did like a country and western version and it came out really good. And I actually invited the guys down here today to, to play it with me because we had a great country band put together in the studio. And uh, they're not here. Don't, don't get me started. But I've got the next best thing for you. It's the karaoke version of the song. And there's a little sing-along part in it for you. So uh, my, my tech crew is on vacation this week. I need to set this up myself. It'll take me about 15 seconds, so don't go anywhere. <clears throat> Because he barely hit his way. Though known for his infield utility, set the benchmark for futility, flirting with 200 all the time. Now in 79, got an all time mark for the most game played in a big league park with an average of The man does a line. I'll take a blue from the player, 16 hopper, a lucky bouncer, a Baltimore chopper, just get me cross. That old Mendoza line, cross that old Mendoza line. Of course, I prefer a frozen rope, but swinging 
but give me hope. I got across that old Mendoza line. Let me hear you now. Come on. Mendoza line. Mendoza line. Just get me across that old Mendoza line. Get me across that old Mendoza line. Mendoza line. Got across that old Mendoza line. This is the only song where I can take a drink in the middle. Only once and here's the stats. Three games played and one hit in five total at bats. I'll do the math correctly. You will surely find. Strike smack dab on that dead door of line. So if you're struggling on the field or any part of life, thank that brave soul from south of the border. Loved and scrapped his whole life through only to be linked to an aptitude in true immortal of a different order. I'll take a blue flag, a 16 hopper, a lucky bat, both the more choppers. Just get me across that old Mendoza line. Get me across that old Mendoza line. Swinging bunt, get me hope. I got across that old Mendoza line. Last time, Mendoza line. Get me across that old Mendoza line. Get me across that old Mendoza line. Mendoza line. God cross that old Mendoza line. You can get me across that old Mendoza line. Get me across that old Mendoza line. Thank you very much. Let me uh, introduce the members of the band. Uh, directly behind me on the drums is Chris Anzalone. Play along, please. Thank you. <laughs> on my left on the bass is Rob Ignazio. To my right on electric guitar and mandolin, Steve Mayone. And on backup vocals, actually, I did all the backup vocals because, you know, when you go into a studio and you hire professional singers, it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. So. I did all the vocals myself. I only charged myself half as much, so I <laughs> saved a lot of money. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself right now, this is just some cheap publicity stunt to promote the CD. <sighs> Let me tell you something. You're right. You got me. So it's, it's called Baseball's Greatest Hits, Volume 2. We're going to give away one of them right now. And if you don't win, uh, they're only $5 each, so uh, check it out. So we're going to get the bowl and draw out the winner. And the winning, boy, the hush in the room now is the tension. Okay, the winner is, let's see, I can't, uh, Anne Marie White. There we go. All righty, so uh, a lot of people say, let me get this. A lot of people think that football has supplanted baseball as the national pastime, you know, because the ratings are big and everybody's talking about it. I don't happen to agree. I think more people understand baseball, read about it, listen to it on the radio, uh, know the rules, know the players, have played softball or baseball at some point in their life. So, so Baseball is firmly entrenched in our psyche. I, I don't think football will, will ever surpass it. Now, several decades ago, the, great, the late great comedian, George Carlin, did a terrific comedy piece comparing baseball to football, and I would like to share that with you right now. Baseball is a 19th century pastoral game. Football is a 20th century technological struggle. Baseball's played on a diamond in a park, a baseball park. Football's played on a gridiron in a stadium sometimes called Soldier Field or War Memorial Stadium. Football, you wear a helmet. Baseball, you wear a cap. 
Football is concerned with downs. What down is it? Baseball is concerned with ups. Who's up? In football, you receive a penalty. In baseball, you make an error. Football has clipping, spearing, piling on, personal fouls, late hitting, and unnecessary roughness. Baseball has the sacrifice. Football is played in any kind of weather, rain, snow, sleet, hail, fog. But in baseball, if it rains, we do not go out to play. Baseball has a seventh inning stretch. Football has the two minute warning. Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's gonna end. We might have extra innings. Football is rigidly timed and will end even if we have to go to sudden death. And finally, the objectives of the two games are completely different. In football, the object is for the quarterback, also known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack that punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In baseball, the object is to go home and be safe. All right, I got a couple more songs to do. I want to thank you all for coming and uh, being a great audience, really. You did all the things that a good audience is supposed to do. You know, you clapped, you listened, you sang along, you laughed at some of my jokes. I appreciate that. And I also want to thank the Stoughton Senior Center here. Give them a nice round of applause for organizing this event. And also the uh, Stoughton Cultural Council which is uh, funding today's event, because believe it or not, I actually get paid for doing this. I, I can't believe it myself, but, but it's great. They do a lot of funding of uh, programs in the, in the town, and, and it's a terrific thing. So, also, uh, I also, I do a lot of different kinds of shows. So I, I also play in a duo called Knock on Wood. My partner plays uh, fiddle and mandolin and uh, sings backup vocals, and uh, we do a lot of outdoor concerts. So we're, we're, uh, we're down in south of Boston here quite a bit. The schedule, the partial schedule is on the table over there, as is a schedule of, uh, of my upcoming baseball shows. I only have three left, though. And uh, anything on the table that's a loose sheet, you, you're welcome to pick up. And uh, if you didn't win the CD raffle, uh, they're reasonably priced. Price to move, so check it out. And uh, this is a song you can uh, participate in, in any number of ways, you know, you can uh, sing along, you can tap your feet, you can do this stuff, so. They, they play it at Fenway Park all the time, so I figured I would include it in the show. Get your hands up, everybody. Hands up. Hands. Get them up. Come on. Touching hands. Reaching out. Touching me. Touching you. Sweet Caroline. Good time that never seemed so good. I've been inclined to believe they never would, but now I look at the night and it don't seem so lonely. We fill it up with only two. And when I heard runs off my shoulder how can I hurt when holding you hands up one more time warm touching warm 
reaching out, touching me, touching you, sweet Caroline. Good times that never seem so good. I I've been inclined to believe they never would. Sweet Caroline, good times that never seem so good. I I've been inclined. To believe they never would. All right, it's been a fun hour. I appreciate it. Appreciate you coming out, and uh, hope you enjoyed it half as much as I did. So, thank you. So, like I said, we got some stuff on the table. If you want to just come up and say hello. I'm very friendly, so especially when I'm trying to sell you a CD. <laughs> so this is a baseball song that was uh, written in 1908, written by Albert von Tisler and Jack Norworth, neither of whom had ever been to a baseball game prior to writing the song, and they didn't go to a game for like another 20 years or so. So apparently they weren't terribly convinced about their subject matter, but that's neither here nor there. I believe you know the words to this, so please join in and sing. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jack. I don't care if I and it's root, root, root for the Red Sox. If they don't start a new winning streak pretty soon, it'll be a shame. And it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Well, if I was going to give you a grade for that singing performance, uh, and if I was in a really good mood, I'd probably give you a B minus. So let's try it one more time. Because, you know, the Red Sox are playing extremely well. We're very excited about that. And so I want to hear it one more time with a little more enthusiasm, a little more passion, a little more volume. Okay, here we go. Take me out to... Oh, it's much better. Thank you. Okay. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jam. I don't care if I And it's root, root, root for the Red Sox If they don't win, it's a shame Big finish now, here we go For it's Three strikes, you're out at the old ball game Alrighty, have a great week, thank you